What's going on guys? Welcome to the part two video of my CNC build series. There's gonna be a lot of technical information in this one, so it might not be the most entertaining video in the world, but if you're thinking about building a CNC machine or if you're in the process of building a CNC machine, you might get a little bit of information that you're looking for, so just bear with me. When building a CNC machine, the base is literally your foundation, so you wanna make sure you do the best job that you can, and a good start is making it nice and square. I put a framer square up against the factory edge and I'm using a razor knife to scribe a 90 degree offset on each side. And so hopefully I'm gonna be able to cut it out and it's gonna be fairly square for the next step in the process. All right, so we have our plate of 3 16 steel that I just cut. I cut it to 30 by 18 inches, which is all relative to the size of the table that you're trying to build. And I cut that as square as I could, but it's a little bit irrelevant because what really matters is I picked out some angle profile, some 90 degree profile. And at the store, I picked absolutely the straightest ones that I could get. And what we're going to do is we're going to attach one rail. Uh, we're going to use flat head screws from the other side. So it's still going to be flat on the other side, but it's going to be attached. And then I have a special trick for attaching the other one. And the whole point is these have to be as close to parallel as possible in order to make the gantry function properly on this rail. Drilling and tapping holes isn't exceptionally complicated. The only trick is you want to pick the correct drill size for the tap that you're using. And you don't have to countersink if you're not using countersunk screws. In this case, we're using flathead screws, so we have to countersink for them to fit right. It makes things a lot easier to use a little bit of lubrication, especially when you're running the tap, and it's also gonna make your tools last a little bit longer. So we have one side that's completely fixed, drilled, tapped, and countersunk, so it's not going anywhere. So we need to make sure that, that other rail is completely parallel or as close as we can get it to the other one. And the way I'm doing that, I know if you're any type of legitimate technician or machinist or anything like that, this is going to make you cringe super bad, but it's going to work. Don't panic. And don't forget, we're still going to be able to shim this up later on. But anyway, so I took a piece of wood. I made sure it was square on both ends and then I cut it. So I cut it to the length that we needed and then I ripped it down. So this was actually one piece of wood. So they're exactly the same length. And what that's doing is it's making the distance on this end the exact same as the distance on that end. And so theoretically, they're going to be parallel. So we're still going to be able to, if we need, shim the rails. Hopefully we won't have to, but it's an option that we have. So there's all kinds of different linear rail setups that you can go with. This particular setup I went with because it's so inexpensive. It's all based off of this angle profile right here. So this is the carriage, but also this is the same material that we're using for the rail itself. And that's part of why it's so inexpensive. So it's all based off of these hobby bearings right here. These are about 50 cents each if you get them on eBay. And these are six millimeter inside diameter. Well, this is actually to scale right here. If you space them apart appropriately, so you have two on top, one on the bottom, you can change the configuration, it doesn't matter. But as long as you have some on top and some on bottom with enough spacing in the middle for the rail itself to fit into, the carriage is gonna be able to slide really, really smoothly across that rail. And that's the whole premise behind this. All right, so we have our carriage assembled on the rail. It's a little bit on the tight side, so we might make a little bit of adjustment here, but you guys can see exactly how it works. If it wants to come off. So we have our two bearings on the top, one on the bottom, and the rail goes in the middle. And you can see that I had to shave off just a tiny bit behind those back bearings because uh, the tolerances were a little bit on the tight side. So what happens when you fly too close to the sun. The last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add two bearings on this wall. And the whole point is that we have this motion down pretty good, but it's still able to rack this way. So when we put bearings going in a different plane, it's gonna prevent it from racking. And so we're gonna have perfect linear motion, or at least close to perfect linear motion. Let's dissect these rails a little bit. So the setup that you've already seen is the three bearings that are on this particular part of the plate. And so obviously the rail slides in between these three. And then these two on the other side, on the other plane, are just retainers. So what they're doing is they're preventing, as it's going down the rail, they're preventing the rail from going like this. And I know some of you are probably gonna wonder, what's keeping it from going out this way? Well, that's a great question. These are actually going to be bridging the gantry. So the gantry itself is going to be holding them tight up against the rails, which are going to be on either side of the foundation. And that is going to make the cleanest possible lateral movement that we can get out of pretty much the cheapest setup that you can make. And it's not quite broken in. They're a little bit chunky and they're really cheap bearings. 
But if you pick through the litter and find the ones that move the best and maybe give them a little bit of time to break in, eventually they're gonna work out great and there is no movement in there. They are rock solid. So for the money, this is the best way to go. I'm not saying it's the best way to go if you have more money, but for this amount of money, this is definitely the way to go. If you're gonna try to emulate this setup, the hardware stack up is actually super important. So in this example, the center portion of the bearing is actually remaining stationary, and then the outer portion is the part that moves, obviously. But so I put the screw in from the bottom, and then I put a nut on it, and so what those are doing is they're grabbing the center portion of the bearing, and then it goes through the metal, and then we have a lock washer, and then another nut right here. And so this is a nice, secure setup. It's holding everything really well, and it's preventing the center from moving, but it's also allowing the bearing to function properly. If you grab it too tightly, it's gonna prevent the bearing from working properly. And if you grab it too loosely, then your tolerance is gonna be a lot looser and your accuracy is not gonna be what you're looking for. We have our rail here, which we're mounting directly to the base of our CNC machine that we just built. And so we're using our calipers here. We're gonna go ahead and uh, try to get it as level and as flat as possible. Now, this is where we start running into the limitations of the material itself that we're using. So it's not gonna be perfectly flat, but if you use these, you're gonna be able to get relatively close and it's gonna get you right where you need to be. There's definitely better ways that you're able to do this, but like I was saying before, they're gonna be more expensive. This is an economical route and honestly, do we need to make a CNC machine that's going to be able to keep within a few thou? I think it's probably worth it, but for most people, it's not going to be. So that's why I'm showing you guys how to do it this way. So we're off by about four and a half thou right there, which like I was saying, we're pretty good in terms of just the stability of the dimensional properties of this material. So it could certainly be better, but it could certainly be a lot worse. And so there is actually a bit of a dip going on in this piece of metal here. So overall we have about 10 thousandths of deviation. So, uh, and then just for frame of reference here. So let's get it set to 10 thou. This is always a pain. It's a 0.26 millimeters, 10 thou. And so it's not a whole lot. Now, if you're a machinist, it's a lot, but for us, it's not that much. So I think I'm gonna be able to live with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and mount the rail and then uh, we can get the other side calibrated to this one. The means which I have chosen to attach the rails to the actual bed of the CNC machine is I'm using some countersunk screws. These particular ones are 832. It's a little bit irrelevant. The countersunk part is the important part to me. So obviously we gotta Drill them out with the appropriate size drill bit, use a countersink, and then tap them so the screws are able to go in there. Uh, but the reason we're doing countersunk in this particular case is so it doesn't impede any of the mechanisms that glide across this. And so, as you can see, as we're going across, it's not catching on any of those screws. So that's part of the reason why we're going with that. Also, I kind of like the look, if I'm honest with you. So I'm gonna just go ahead and keep it fairly consistent so I don't have to buy bunch of different kinds of hardware. That's the way I'm doing it. Now, the way I'm marking them out is I'm just using this guy to scribe into the metal. And so I kind of do it in line with the screws that are already in the top of the bed. Make a little line so I can see it. And then I'm actually drilling just under the line. So you, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but I'm drilling just under the line. And then even with the countersink, it shouldn't impact the bearings on the actual carriage. So now that we have the rail that's attached to the other side on, we wanna attach this rail. So what you wanna do is you wanna match the gap. So we were measuring from the top down to the very top of this profile. So you wanna match that gap across the whole thing, get it as close to zero as you possibly can. And there's one thing I forgot to mention when attaching the other rail. So if you have a perfectly straight piece of metal, that's good. It's pretty unlikely because these don't come out of a machine shop, they come out of a steel mill. So what you wanna do is if you have a bow or anything like that, you wanna put the bow up against the bed because the bed already has some dimensional stability to it and so what it's going to do when you screw it into that is it's going to take on that dimensional stability so if there's a bow in this piece it's going to unbow it theoretically this is all kind of theoretical but it's definitely a good practice if you're going to be doing something like this we're at a stage in our build now where things are going to go down a little bit different of a path so we've been countersinking and tapping all of our holes this is a situation right here and I'm not going to be doing that. And the reason is this is gonna be 
the risers for our gantry. This is our carriage right here. And so what I'm going to do is just use regular pan head or truss head screws. It doesn't really matter. So I'm going to through bolt. So, you know, I'm going to use nuts to hold them together. And the reason I'm going to do that is if at any point I want to change the alignment of the carriage relative to the riser of the gantry, I'm going to be able to just loosen up those screws, make adjustments, and then tighten them back down. So that's why we're not going to be countersinking anything. Just going to drill straight through. So what I have here is we have two risers and then we have the one inch square stock. This is just a spacer because we're going to be using it somewhere else. I just want this dimension to be accurate. So I want the holes to be in the correct location for everything later on. So this is coming out, but we're, we are going to be attaching these right now. Now that we have our gantry risers attached to our carriage, we can go ahead and uh, mock it up. I mentioned earlier that this is only part of the equation. We need the other side to add stability to this. But even right now, this is really good. This is a hell of a good start. And when you try to rock it, there is almost no play at all. This is exactly what we want. It's all still adjustable at this point. So we gotta make the other side, maybe throw something in there so I can show you guys what this thing is made of. It should be pretty good, man. So now this is probably starting to look like a CNC machine. It's a pretty good little deal we got going on. So I mentioned earlier that we actually need both of the risers to be complete for this actually to work. So they're actually supporting each other. They're sucking each other towards the base, which is exactly what we need. And in this configuration, it works pretty good. Now, one of the things that's going to happen, it happened on my last machine, I already know, is it can rack a little bit, and that absolutely murders your accuracy. The way we're gonna circumvent that is we're gonna have an x-axis motor on each side. So it's gonna be pulling from both sides, it's gonna be pushing from both sides, and so it's gonna even out that motion, and so they're gonna be moving together, no racking. As long as you keep it calibrated, you're good to go. So this is a, just a mock-up of the y-axis rails. This one is going to be the actual type of rail that we're using. It's obviously not cut down yet and there's no bolts in there, but I just wanted to show you guys what was going on here because that was a lot of work. You guys have been really patient watching this video. So I wanted to show you what you have to look forward to when you're done. But this thing is strong. This thing is smooth and this thing is good. This is an awesome, awesome start, especially for the cheap CNC machine. I mean, this is not going to cost that much money to produce and it is not going to be bad. You might be wondering if having shorter carriages is what's causing the racking. Why wouldn't I just make longer carriages? Well, if you have a longer carriage, it's going to, you have to make a much larger machine in order to have good range of motion. So I went with a shorter carriage and that means I'm going to be able to have good range of motion. And like I said, I'm going to be using a motor on each side. So we're not going to rack anyway but range of motion was critical in this particular aspect. I didn't want to have to make a big, massive machine just to make room for my carriages. Well, I think that was probably enough information to cover for one video. If you guys have any questions about anything that I've done so far or anything that I'm about to do that you want to understand a little bit more about, just go ahead and reach out to me. I'll be happy to help you guys out. Thanks for watching and thanks always for doing your part to help make this world a strange place.